Mir and I are just going to share some topics, ideas, questions that neither of us have really prepped the other on or thought about at all necessarily. What event has had a large impact on your life? What's something cool you've heard recently that stuck with you? Welcome to 30 Minute You, the university launched for you, where your co-hosts go over real world topics through a live mentorship podcast so you can walk away with the skills you need to succeed in your field in only 30 minutes. My name is Mir, one of the co-hosts, and I host one of the world's top mentorship platforms where I interview people like the mayor of Miami, the founder of Reebok, and the former CEO of Chipotle to provide you real life mentorship in your pocket. And my name is Carmen. Over the last 10 years, I've launched over 70 companies spanning in industries like hospitality, real estate, retail, and cannabis with hundreds of employees. I am an investor, lawyer, and educator. And we hope you enjoyed listening to this show as much as we enjoyed recording it. We'll see you inside the classroom. All right, everyone. Welcome back to 30 Minute You with Carmen and Mir. Uh, this is a little bit of a bonus content, a little uh, uh, different feature than what we're used to in the previous uh, podcasts. We're still going to stick under the 30 minutes for you, but in this uh, iteration, this 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 format. Um, Mir and I are just going to share some topics, ideas, questions that neither of us have really uh, prepped the other on uh, or thought about at all necessarily. And just let the flow of conversation uh, go back and forth. The topics are um, any variety, any direction. Uh, think of, uh, uh, pardon the interruption, on uh, ESPN, just sort of that uh, group think. I've got, uh, I appreciate the little nod. If I get to do a plug, there it is, Sir Lilac. Uh, not my favorite hat, but I know Carmen. Uh, apparently, uh, that's said at the front door of some of these nightclubs as though uh, not even knowing who the hell I am, which is the irony of it. But uh, And we've got, what, a Disco Fever. This is with a Joy District collaboration um, with Sir Lilac. Uh, that's our uh, fashion company. Uh, sirlilac.co um, online. There's a new collection dropping? New collection drops in May, uh, probably toward the latter half of May. But uh, if you yeah. guys see us wearing anything else other than Sirlilac on this podcast, <laughs> we've done a terrible job. Yeah, it's it's a terrible, terrible job. I have, certainly. Yeah. yeah. All right. So am I starting or do you want to start? Let me start. Go. I will ask it to you, then I'll go. What event has had a large impact on your life? Wow. I mean, but you're going to you're going to answer yours? Yes, I can go first or you Can go? you go first cuz that's a big first. one. Wow. An event that has had a large impact on my life shoot goes back to COVID. Um Carmen and I had a podcast together a couple of years ago now where we spoke about professional crisis and Carmen said something to me. He said he looked at me and it was a virtual interview back then and he said you guys Gen Zs have never been through a professional crisis. COVID was your first. Carmen's and he's not old. He's a little bit older than me. So he Thank you for that. He, he's seen 2008 maybe as an infant. But we didn't us Gen Zs, right? We grew up in a normal world and then all of a sudden everything gets shut down, businesses are going under. Having said that, I took a, an extremely painful investment loss in the capital markets. My worst ever. I mean, you're talking about the S&P dropped almost 40% in four weeks. Um, I watched companies that I held like Lyft and Delta Airlines drop 70%. Marriott dro stock dropped 60, 70%. I was watching companies drop 80, 90%. Like I was watching the stock market. Like they were literally putting the market on a halt every day because every day futures were down another 5%. And I'm like, holy crud. I've never seen something like this. That was the first time I was exposed to this drug called margin. And mm. I got wiped out. One of the most painful experiences of my life. I contemplated, you know, a lot of negative thoughts, a lot of things where I just felt like this was something I could not come out of. It's almost like, imagine working so hard towards something. Of course. You build up such a significant portion of wealth at such a young age. I'm 19 years old. I'm like, dude, I'm the man. This is, we spoke about this in our previous episode about toxic traits. I felt like this superiority complex, like no one can really mess with me. I've mastered the markets. Mm. Lo and behold, as soon as you say that, the markets will humble you. That thing killed me. Um, I'm here today. I've become a more astute investor as a result. I've become more cynical. I question things a lot more. And I do a lot more due diligence now. But that experience really, really was a painful one that I still think about today. You're up. Well, <laughs> I didn't mean to open up with such a <laughs> emotional uh, and, and, and dramatic. And, and obviously, you know, I'll stick in theme. There's, there's definitely a lot of moments in life that have real estate in my mind. Uh, and I'm going to take a second to describe that. Um, I think 
we, we when we talk about just having strong mindsets, it's another way of looking at it is that you're building a city in your mind and you live in your mind as well. The obvious point. And when I wake up in the morning and I look out my window, I don't want to see that negative skyscraper. You know, if I had a business associate screw me over, I don't need to be thinking about that person all the time where every time I look out the window, every time I drive down the, the street, I see it that person's skyscrapers because they own so much time in my mind. Uh, and I am, I'm always thinking about them. I, I want them to be level playing fields. I don't want to see them. I don't want to think about it. So like owning your owning that real estate, don't let people or experiences uh, dominate the real estate portfolio of your mind. Uh, that said, uh, I probably have more smaller, intimate, personal moments that have larger impacts. Um, I, I just, it would take me the proverbial 60 minutes in, this, in the psychiatrist chair to, to really get into it. Um, but let me, let me, let me I, I, I've got uh, in the same vein. Um, at, when COVID took place, I had just gotten out of a pretty significant failure where I put the concept uh, the capital, I put it all on my back. Um, it was in, I developed a concept in a very popular trending neighborhood in downtown Chicago. And I had been experiencing some pretty cool success. And I drove that bus um, without taking my foot off the pedal. And despite any sort of, you know, signs of caution or even more importantly peers and colleagues advice uh, or their their input i was tunnel vision i was convinced i was right um i guess we all know where this story is going it didn't work uh it was not what the market wanted um you know that the lesson there is give them what they want don't try to force a triangle in a square peg but um you know more importantly, it that happened, then the pandemic happened. Mm. So now my confidence is a little bit shuttered. And what also sort of took place is the confidence from those around me. I mean, they saw the kink in my armor. I'd just gotten through a failure. And I had one, I had another one hit uh, out of state. And again, something that I put the dollars and the concept on my back and ran with. And because of the, because of the, the fact that everyone was experiencing crisis during COVID, I not only didn't have the resources and help I might have before, I also kind of didn't have the, the, the trust and confidence because I just failed. So, I mean, I had two pretty substantial failures. And the second one, I, I had to deal with it myself. And in order to get out from under it, I made some very risky and dangerous financial decisions uh that it you know at the time i thought you know this is it uh, i'm gonna bet on myself and uh that was i mean think about it we're, we're, we're sitting years after the pandemic i i just got out from underneath some of those sort of financial constraints um and and i'll tell you the reason i i might have been able to i remember the moment i might have been able to to throw out my arms and just say do your worst. Let's fight the good fight. Instead, I decided to do the right thing uh, and pay back my obligations and sink myself into debt. Um, I guess I'm saying that there sometimes is strategy and digging in and fighting and buying yourself time. This one, I, I don't want to say I took the high road. I just, I just realized that okay, maybe because I'm a little younger, maybe because, you know, um, I don't want my ego to be dented too hard for a second time in a short amount of period. Uh, I decided to do it, but yeah, that, that had lasting, that had lasting effect. So way to go, way to go with your question and, 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 uh, make both of us a wreck within the first <laughs> yeah, five powerful. minutes of this. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. What other life traumatizing, horrifying <laughs> memories can I drudge up? All right, my turn. Let me try to turn this thing around. Um, what's something cool you've heard recently, uh, that stuck with you? It could be a stat, it could be a quote, it could be... Uh, whatever, advice, this, that, it could be. I will make it actually extremely positive now. 
um, mm. cause you got me emotional. We're both emotional <laughs> in this now. I hate talking about losses. Um, but so I heard this, there's, there's this guy that I really like who I got to have dinner with when I was on this, uh, TV show, uh, about a year ago in Vegas. His, his name is Ed Milet. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Mm-mm. He might've not, but he's a, he's a guy that got into financial services. He crushed it in his career. He ended up making, you know, his net worth is maybe four or 500 million now. Just bought an island. It's Pretty super good. cool stuff. But the 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 he had said something uh, a couple weeks ago. I listened to him in an interview with Jay Shetty. You know Jay Shetty. I I'm yeah. familiar. Yeah. And so he he talked about his dad. So his dad his dad was a drunk alcoholic growing up, and raving alcoholic. Like talking about in the morning having vodka. And this is not your weekend at Joy. This is like this guy was an alcoholic. Like seven days. Drink later. responsibly. Yes, drink responsibly. This guy was a huge alcoholic. Went to all the trainings and camps and and one day he had got home and so you know ed had asked him ed asked his dad he said dad are you gonna are you gonna like what's happening here so the dad had threw all the alcohol out one day and he said what are you doing and he said he said look i'm i I don't know what's gonna happen but i'm gonna stay sober today and he's like do you you plan on just on staying sober he said no i'm I'm gonna stay sober just for today Mm -hmm. and it's it's just this idea of the power of one more so Mm -hmm. his dad ended up getting sober by just saying today on Monday, I'm going to be sober just today. I don't know if I'm going to be sober tomorrow. I might lose. I might go drunk as heck tomorrow. And so this, he Ed's, Ed's been spending his career talking about the concept of the power of one more, one more phone call, one more podcast, one more launch, one more. I love that. One more call. And so now that's stuck with me. That whatever's happening in life, maybe it's one more investment. Maybe it's one more relationship. Maybe it's one more cold call that you got to make, or one cold email to an introduction, or one more meeting. And so this idea of the power of one more, super cool and super inspiring. It stuck with me. That is great. That is, that is cool. Obviously, I mean, we could spend hours talking about that yeah. uh, in the way that we approach every day, in the way that we, you know, consolidate our goals to be more realistic and attainable in a short term, as opposed to too lofty and grandiose and hard to get your arms around. Yeah, I really like that. Um, <clears throat> so something cool that I, I'm going to say that it's something cool that I'd recently heard but I'm going to flip. I didn't initially find it cool. Um, Confidence is about being the president of your own fan club. That's what I hear. Confidence is about being the president of your own fan club. When I first heard that, I'm like, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. Um, It's kind of arrogant. It's kind of uh, presumptuous. We're assuming that there are people in your fan club, um, you know, and you touting around the sash as the president of your own fan club. Uh, I just, I had a problem with it, but because I had a problem with it, I kept thinking on it. And if you break down the certain parts of it, the idea of having a fan club means that you are, you're, you're, you're representing and putting out a product that people really jive with, um, which is to say, okay, I'm very thoughtful about my brand, uh, so much so that a fan club has been created um, again, the assumption that there's members, but that means that I've, I've, I'm, my approach to the brand is, is, is there's real strategy there. It's not, I'm not shoving it down your throat. Uh, you know, that, that, that fan club doesn't sound fun. Uh, and then we're talking about the confidence of it. So the confidence to be the president. Well, how did you become the president? Did you run? You know, did, were you in a contested election for president of the fan club? Um, you know, and if so, uh, you know, what was your message? How did you inspire the members? Uh, I, 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 and I think the reason that I like that, say, I mean, certainly the, the, the root of the um, advice is confidence. Um, but I think if you, if you look at, you know, what it would take to have a fan club and the brand considerations and the courage or or uh, the loftiness of running for president. I think you could dissect that. And I, I, I sort of like that. I like that. I like that quote a lot, actually. The president of your own fan club. Yeah, that's really good. You embody it. Okay. Uh, you or me? I'll go. Tell me about one thing on your bucket list. Uh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, this one is... <laughs> This one is, um, it's a very, uh, uh, it's very personal to me Mm -hmm. because I am live figuring out why it has remained in my bucket list. Uh, and maybe, maybe the listeners or listener (laughs) can help, uh, me figure this out, but it's, 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 it's resorted to a lot of self-reflection. So during COVID, 
I, I think we, I mean, <clears throat> there were some really important moments of time management during COVID. Mm -hmm. And then there was a lot of waste because I, I didn't know it was coming. Yeah. Um, but for the, once I realized like, uh, this isn't going away, we're not reopening. I mean, after like the first shutdown, reopen shutdown, I was like, this, we're going to, so, so much of my time during the day, whether it's, you know, representing clients who are mostly developers and business owners as an attorney or managing the hospitality portfolio, well, those, a lot of that was shut down. So I decided to do uh, a bucket list project. And that was, wow. um, I, we, I wrote a script. I wanted to do a sitcom. Um, we mentioned Sir Lalak. I wanted to get into fashion. I think that's part of like the entrepreneurial uh, spirit is getting into things you know nothing about. Like I didn't hardly know anything about hospitality. Um, so I want to get into not necessarily film, but entertainment. I like the sitcom. And my story is, um, it's called uh, Under the Influence, uh, UTI. Uh, under the influence and it's about a group of friends um one's a business owner wants to open up a bar one is a successful attorney one is a um, chief of staff to a mayor of a big city i don't know where i get these ideas and inspirations from um and then they they embark to solve a problem in the city and in doing so uh, what is revealed is a whole new idea that they go into business with. And it's the drama comedy and it's got all of the, uh, and the only reason I'm going into this is because the pilot is written. It's registered uh, out West. Uh, there's the a movie board, or excuse me, a movie board. There's a storyboard of the eight episodes. Okay. Uh, I haven't, and there's been about eight edits. I, 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 um, I retained a very, credible, very credible writer um, in Los Angeles uh, to sort of, you know, help me with the edits uh, and fine tune it. I don't think I've picked it up in, you know, certainly over a year, maybe almost two years. Um, because what happened was everything turned back on. So it's like, well, how do you go back to this project? What am I, where am I finding the time? Is it a passion project? It's definitely a long shot. Am I being negligent or by focusing on what could be a hobby and given the probability of success? I don't know. I, I really struggle with it. Yeah. But I, it, it owns skyscrapers in my mind, uh, this sort of bucket list project that's sitting there um, that I haven't gotten back to. And it's almost like even if it's – it's scary, and even if it doesn't work, don't you just want to have, like, at least you could say you I, did it, right? So my, so what I want to do is get the pilot, just, I want to go through some meetings, get the pilot bound, mm -hmm. and at the very least, I'll give it as stocking stuffers. Like, here's 30 pages of some crap that was written. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> here, look, fine, yeah. at least I did it. You know, that that's how, it's really my only goal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's that. I never knew that. I mean, I, I guess I could allude to it. You're getting into fashion. You're doing other things now. The the cool joy district experience, but that's awesome. So, how soon can we will we see that? Maybe <laughs> you guys. I, I need somebody to help me solve my my time management allocation when it comes to something that has a very very small chance of success. I I, I just haven't gone back to it. Go to our uh, time management episode. I I queer <laughs> yes. Drink my own medicine <laughs> or poison, depending on what how you take what I say. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. For me bucket list item it's a little bit more nerdy but i would like to be able to ipo something that i have complete ownership in i'd love to be able to ring the nasdaq bell and i think for me the significance mm -hmm. is my my parents came from nothing they came from the middle east you traditionally don't see like many like international slash like middle east on that nasdaq ringing the bell mm -hmm. so at some point and i've been to the nasdaq a couple times companies i've worked with have ipo twice already but i haven't had something that i'm the owner in that I got to IPO and I would freaking love that experience. It's not even about the money. It's like the, the, the American dream legacy that you could do with that. You know, as you were just, you did a, you did a fantastic job at framing the visual because, and you nailed it at the end. I, I imagine that, um, literal ringing of the bell, mm -hmm. uh, 
figurative or proverbially means so much more to foreigners because yes. that it typifies America. Mm-hmm. Whereas to, you know, American kids, uh, you know, kids might not see that, uh, you know, may not even know what that means. Yeah. Most of your Gen Z listeners probably don't yeah. even know what that means. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, I, that's, that's really, really cool. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about too. Yeah. That, and it, you could hear it. Yeah. Yeah. You can hear you it. Can and I, I, I could close my eyes and I could see people I've known who've done it and like it, there's champagne and it's yeah. just, and it's a Wednesday morning. Yeah. It's <laughs> you know, it's, Wednesday it's, 9am. Nice right. deck ring. Um, yeah. Times Square. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Love that. Um, okay. I'm up. Um, a guilty pleasure that you know you should have the discipline to, to not partake in as often as you do. Can't wait to hear yours. <laughs> Mine's more simplistic, but, um, so, uh, I would, you know, for anyone who's been following me for quite some time knows how important this weight loss journey is to me. I've spoken to you about it many times. I'm, I'm sure you've, you've seen some of the transformation. Um, since we started 30 minute you in January, I've lost about 37 pounds. So from December, whatever to now April, May now 37 pounds. I got to lose another, I want to lose between 65 to 70. Having said that, I don't know what it is that when Fridays and Saturdays hit, I love, you know, I, I love to have a nice drink, but I, once that starts transitioning into food and then, you know, I, I love good restaurants in Chicago, shout out to us. We have some of the best restaurants and I've been to every state fact fact right and so i love our food and you know you i'm sure you understand once you drink and once you go out and have good food i overdo it and i and i i overdo it through 1 a.m 2 a.m and it's a guilty pleasure of mine because i know i shouldn't be doing it but it sort of stagnates my progress when i 10 exit yeah it's i think a theme the reason why i wanted to ask this question is another one that is Perhaps open-ended, but more importantly, the case by case, there's probably not necessarily a right or wrong answer. Meaning, query as to your motivation and dedication. If you had zero, if you if you had like a absolute zero percent guilty pleasure of food, mm-hmm. because that's depriving. Um, I think a key theme is like whether it's healthy. And I don't mean healthy as in counting calories. I mean healthy as in you're rewarding yourself. Like I've, I've lost 37 pounds. If I can't enjoy something that I enjoy, what am I doing? Like what, what is this for? And where is the end, by the way? Um, so I think, I think what, what, when you ask a question like that, you're talking about like what is your guilty pleasure? You're more talking about your attitude toward moderation. I, I am often criticized. Uh, Although I think I've done a lot better of a job at um, curtailing uh, my Instagram uh, stories because uh, I I live by the work hard, play harder. Mm-hmm. Like it's just to me there is like I I, I gain so much um, personal satisfaction on a short amount of sleep. Um, where just a few hours ago I was having an amazing time. Now I'm in an office having an amazing meeting and you just, you just keep, you know, you're like a machine, you know, it just doesn't matter. You know, your speed is go. Uh, that said, um, there is something to be said about health and moderation. I, my guilty pleasures when it comes to like you, you'd said food. I, there is nothing in my entire life more than I love than an ice cold Coca-Cola. McDonald's has that Coca-Cola fountain drink that's something else is different. But if you have a really cold can of Coke in the fridge and then you're pouring it over ice, it is, it is amazing. Yeah. I would drink 10 Coca-Colas a day if I could. Uh, I drink? love cake. No, how many do I drink? Yeah. I'm one or two a week, okay. maybe. And that is like really a, an award, like unless I'm hitting... Something I'm I, I, I'm very conscious of it. When I was in school, when I was in law school, I drank I you know I would drink Coca Cola as almost sustenance, like yeah. just to keep going and fill the stomach because I don't want to leave. But um, yeah, there's definitely something about like, and I'm gonna take this just one click over. Um, the desire to 
overstimulate? Because I figured on the Gen Z, you were going to go with the screen time. Mm-hmm. Like the Twitter, Instagram, and OnlyFans. There's no doubt that the experience and the desire is there. Mm-hmm. But it, it, it can't be healthy. Like that, w- without discipline and moderation, what you're doing there does not convert into healthy habits. Yeah. So like, you know, th- that's an example that's a little bit more clear. Yeah. But if you're looking at it in a reward perspective, um, it's interesting. I love that. Yeah, it's not, that's not a bad guilty pleasure. I mean, I know I know Coke is a ton of shit. Well, OnlyFans is a bad yeah, guilty yeah, pleasure. Yeah, that one can be bad. Yes, very bad. I'm up. You're up if you got one. We'll finish it with you if, if you've got one. We'll finish it. All right, so this one... You know, this is one I'm going to, just like I usually close it with a hot take for you, this is one that I can't completely answer yet, but I'm visualizing it to be able to answer it. Mm. What do you prefer? And I, I, it's a little bit bougie. Do you prefer flying first class or flying private? <laughs> <laughs> this is a, what a horrible question that I hope gets edited so I can't gain more haters by going through this experience. This won't be getting motivation? <clears throat> Man, there's no good answer here. Um, growing up, family, it, whatever vacation we had was always coach. Okay. Um, the first time I had flown first class was a result of my booking from whatever money I had made. How old? I was in college, um, probably 20, 21. Where were you going? Probably Vegas. Uh, I had a small business in Vegas that that did do real, but I had businesses like I had businesses that made money while I was in school. Um, after that, it was like, nope, never going, not ever doing. I like this is it. Yeah, I'm never gonna do coach again. I can't. And and now that's that's a, that's, but it was. I know what this costs. I know the delta. It doesn't get me here any faster, and the food isn't that good. Mm-hmm. I mean, whatever you take on a bag from the concourse it is better than the food that's been, yeah. you know, pre-made and yeah. sitting in a whatever cooler for however long. So it's not that in the leg room. I mean, fortunately it's not, you know, it, it's just, okay. The hard work, the equivalent first class, you know, and really the, my favorite part of it is getting off the plane. Yeah. Right. Cause I, I don't look at flying as this wonderful experience, no matter how technologically incredible it is. Um, private <laughs> uh I, I yeah i was in my 20s the first probably dozen times i'd flown i was a guest of somebody very successful how old were you the first time you flew private 24 okay um you know in law school um and they were it's it's a social it's it's a it's an experience unlike anything it's sitting courtside at a at a nba game because that 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 cannot be experienced on a commercial airline, uh, which is to say, you're standing, you're moving, you're laughing, you're playing cards, your chairs are swiveling. The you know, um, and I that that is a that that is a obnoxiousness that is greater than the delta between first class and and coach. Mm. Um, that is that is uh, I, I I will say that. Um, I had years where there was a ton of it, and I've had I I hard I hardly have flown uh, more recently just because you know the economy or whatever people say. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's what a horrible you're a, you're not a good friend for asking me that question. Uh, okay. Do you have anything else to add to to this? I cannot add to it, unfortunately, yeah. yet. Uh-huh. Um, but uh-huh. I ha- this is just beautiful. <laughs> I love that. I love putting Carmen on the spot. We're going to do a whole series just on that. That is fun. Well, close us out, Carmen. Listen, this was a, uh, a new format. Very fun. Love the lack of prep. Um, hopefully it translates. <laughs> uh, love the tangents. Please don't cancel me. And uh, we look forward to the next episode from Carmen and Mir. See you guys next time.